Good morning and welcome to Geisley Baptist Church online service. Today Steve will be speaking to us from the Bible and then Mickey will be leading us in communion. But first let me read some words from the Psalms. Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of his wonderful acts. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Loving God, this morning we come to worship you. We come to seek your face, to focus on you. As we do that, might we be changed. Amen.
But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has also made you his heir. There was once a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of the property now. So the man divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son sold his part of the property and left home with the money. He went to a country far away where he wasted his money in reckless living. He spent everything he had. Then a severe famine spread over that country and he was left without a thing. So he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him out to his farm to take care of the pigs. He wished he could fill himself with the bean pods the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything to eat. At last he came to his senses. All my father's hired workers have more than they can eat, and here I am about to starve. I will get up and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. So he got up and went back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His father was filled with pity and he ran through his arms round his son and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father called his servants. Hurry, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Then go and get the prize calf and kill it and let us celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead and now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. And so the feasting began. What's going on? The servant answered. Your brother has come back home, and your father has killed the prize calf, because he got him back safe and sound. The elder brother was so angry that he would not go into the house. So his father came out and begged him to come in. But he answered his father. Look, all these years I have worked for you like a slave and I have never disobeyed your orders. What have you given me? Not even a goat for me to have a feast with my friends. But this son of yours wasted all your property on prostitutes and when he comes back home, you will kill the prize calf for him. The father answered, My son, you are always here with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be happy because your brother was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he is found. In 
simple trust like theirs who had beside the Syrian sea. The gracious calling of the Lord met us like them without a word. Rise up and follow thee. Rise up and follow thee. <clears throat> Drop thy still views of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace, the beauty of thy peace. Breathe through the heats of our desire, thy coolness and thy palm. Let sense be done, let flesh return, speak through the earthquake, wind and fire, O oh, still small voice of calm, O oh, still small voice of calm. Good morning. Today is Father's Day. And like many of these special days that come round in the course of the year, it can be a day that's more joyful for some than for others. Many people have mixed emotions, to say the least, when these special days come round. Take Christmas, for example. It can be painful if you've recently lost a loved one. Mother's Day can be hard if your mum is no longer with you. Birthdays, anniversaries, these are meant to be happy occasions, but they are not so for everyone. And as for Father's Day, well, for some, it's a chance to take the old boy down the pub, put your hand in your pocket rather than his for a change, and buy him a pint. If your father is still with you, you can tell him you love him. If he's no longer with you, you can remember him fondly. But sadly, that's not true for everyone. Father's Day, for many, can bring very painful memories. Some remember fathers who were unkind or cruel or even violent. Others, their fathers were simply absent. It's been well said that some fathers are an abusive presence, while others are an aching absence. My own father was largely absent. In fact, I barely knew him and my brother and I were brought up, in our earliest years anyway, just by my mum. But because she was strong and loving, I can look back on my childhood with very happy memories, and I realise that is not true of everyone. For those for whom Father's Day is painful, I wonder how they cope. Must it just be a matter of grinning it and bearing it and getting past it? Or is it possible to overcome the negativity that sometimes accompanies these kind of occasions? It's worth saying at the outset that God started anniversaries. If we go back to the Old Testament, we find stories of God appointing certain days and certain places to be times and places when uh, there can be celebration and remembrance. And I think it's true that, as human beings, we need these annual markers, these mileposts. They give a pattern to our lives. They help us to remember people who are important to us. They give a sense of order and progress throughout the year. So what to do with Father's Day? Well, first of all, if I may, a word to all fathers. Being a dad is really hard, especially in the early years when there's a career to pursue and many demands upon one's time. Of course, many mothers also now 
pursue an independent career, and they also have many demands upon their time. But in my experience, and I can only speak from that, women seem to cope better with the adjustment that's required in both marriage and parenthood. I know this is a generalisation, but again, in my experience, I think there's some truth to it that nest building seems to come more naturally to most women than to most men. So being a husband and a father is really hard and we will make mistakes. We will get things wrong. But the most important thing is to hang on in there, stick at it and get better. It is one of the biggest blights on society that so many fathers are not part of their children's lives. A few years ago I read a survey and I don't think the statistics will be very much different today than, than then. It revealed some terrible statistics. Two thirds of youth suicides and 90% of homeless children are from fatherless homes. As are 71% of school dropouts and 85% of young people in prison. Families need fathers. Even if you don't think you're very good, hang on in there. We don't actually have to be perfect. In fact, of course, the perfect dad does not exist. But we can still do a good job. And it will be worth it in the long run. There is a payback down the track. Put in the effort when the children are young and really need us, and we'll have the pleasure of them taking us down the pub to buy us a pint on Father's Day. Or maybe our daughter asking us to walk them down the aisle. Those kind of days and experiences are priceless. Secondly though, a word to those who were disappointed by their fathers. I need to be careful what I say here because as I've already mentioned, my childhood was pretty happy. Some listening this morning might have had anything but a happy childhood. And if that describes you, I suppose the kind of questions I would want to ponder, you to ponder are these. Must our past always determine our future? Or is there a way of breaking free from the past? Might it be possible to overcome the pain of an abusive or absent father? Might it be possible to even forgive one's father for his shortcomings? God is the God of fresh starts and new beginnings. He's the God of the reset button. He's the God of forgiveness. Indeed, he's the God to whom we pray, Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And one other thing for those for whom Father's Day brings painful memories. Perhaps Father's Day is better spent focusing on the fatherhood of God. In Galatians 4 that we heard earlier, we read this. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. You see, whatever shortcomings our earthly fathers might have had, with God as our father, we receive the full rights of sons. We receive everything that God has to offer. I'll comment in a moment, if you'll bear with me, on the use of the non-inclusive word son. And the passage goes on. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you an heir. Now, if you're a woman listening to this, I, please don't be irritated by being called a son. When the New Testament was written, the culture was, of course, that sons inherited and the daughters were married off. So Paul is here being actually quite revolutionary, not reactionary, but revolutionary. 
He is in effect saying, when you turn to God and know him as your father, then whether you're a man or a woman, you, as it were, become a son. You inherit everything that God has to give you. Whatever the world has denied you, however your parents or your father might have failed you, you will inherit from God, you will receive from God all the good things he has to give you. Mark Twain was once interviewed by a reporter <clears throat> who asked him, people say you're the best storyteller who's ever lived. What do you think of that? And Mark Twain replied, I am not the best storyteller who ever lived. Well, said the reporter, who do you think was? And Mark Twain replied, well, that would be Jesus. Oh, said the reporter, well, what's the best story that he ever told? And Mark Twain replied, The Prodigal Son. Now, the title, The Prodigal Son, is not, as far as we know, the title that Jesus gave to the story. In fact, the New Testament doesn't tell us uh, whether, it, whether it had a title or, or, or what it was. The Prodigal Son is just the title that tradition has handed down. And I'm not the only one who thinks there is at least another title to this story that is equally as good as The Prodigal Son. And the story to that alternative title is in the opening words of the parable, if you know it. There was a man who had two sons. There was a man. This is a story just as much about the father as it is about the son. We could just as easily call this story the prodigal father. You see, because just as the son took his father's inheritance and went out and was prodigal with it. He, he was lavish, he was extravagant with it, spending it on worthless friends and uh, d disreputable activities. So when he came home repentant, the father was prodigal in his love. He, he lavished his love and affection and grace and forgiveness on this young man. He, was, he overwhelmed him with love. The father, in a sense, was prodigal, wasteful, extravagant with his love. What a wonderful thing to be a son, or perhaps today we might simply say a child of God. What a wonderful thing to receive this extravagant love of God, to receive everything he has to give us. I hope that today you can think of your father with love, warmth and joy. But if that is not the case, please remember, you are not abandoned. You are not unloved and you are not uncared for. You have a heavenly father who loves you with a love that is extravagant, prodigal, overwhelming. to me, love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? He came from his blessed throne salvation to bestow, but man made strange and none the long for Christ would know. But oh my friend, my friend indeed, who at my need his life did spend. Sometimes they strew his way and his sweet praises sing, resounding all the day hosannas to their king. Then crucify is all their breath, and for his death they thirst and cry. 
cry. They rise and needs will have my dear Lord made away. A murderer, they save the prince of life, they slay. Yet cheerful he to suffering goes that he his foes from thence might flee. In life no house, no home, my Lord on earth might have. In death no friendly term but what a stranger gave. What may I say, and was his home? And mind the tomb wherein he lay. Here might I stay and sing, no story so divine. Never was love, dear king, never was grief like thine. This is my friend in whose sweet praise I all my days could gladly spend. So with the words of that beautiful hymn still on our lips, reminding us of very of the very personal nature of Christ's gift to the whole world, my Saviour's love for me, we come to his table, a reminder of what Christ did for the world that he also did for you and for me, my Saviour's love for me. And because communion is not only an act of thanksgiving or an act of celebration, but importantly, it is an act of remembrance to live as God has, has called us to live, we must remember carefully. We must remember who God is as Christ has shown us. We must remember who we are and who we are called to be in Christ. So remembering it, it's critical for us as God's people. This is what the Apostle Paul reminds us as he reminds us of the institution of the Lord's Supper when he wrote, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you, you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You know, this message applies today in our time, no less than it did so long ago. So here is the table of the Lord and we are gathered to his supper. It's a foretaste of things eternal. So come, come, come when you are fearful to be made new in love. Come when you are doubtful to be made strong in faith. Come when you are regretful to be made whole. But come, come old and young, for there is room for all. So let's pray together as we prepare to share the bread and the wine. And we pray, Lord, you are our dwelling place from generation to generation. And we remember and we give thanks for all that you have done, especially for coming to be with us in Jesus Christ. And as we recall with gratitude and amazement, Christ's sacrifice for us, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. So by your spirit, help us to remember rightly who you are and who we are, and that we may live to the praise of your glory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we come to the table, and you may be alone today taking this communion, but may this be a, a reminder to you that you are not alone, 
that is seated with, with you is Christ and we share with Christ and we're never alone as we take communion. And you may be gathered with friends and loved ones. This is a great opportunity to, to share the bread and to share the wine. So we take the bread and we break it. Christ's body broken for you. And Jesus said, take this and eat it. He said, this is my body and it is given for you. Do this to remember me. So we take the bread, we share it and we eat it. We take the wine, the spilt blood of Christ, the new relationship with God made possible, as Jesus says, by my death. So take this, all of you, to remember me. as we shared in the, the broken body and the spilt blood of our Lord and Saviour, let's come together in prayer for others with hearts full of gratitude for what God has given us in this sacred meal. We pray for others. And mindful of Steve's words earlier in our service, we give thanks, Creator God, for the fathers in our lives. And we know fatherhood doesn't come with a manual. In reality, teaches us that some fathers excel while others fail so we pray and we ask for Lord for your blessing on all of them and we ask for forgiveness where it is needed on this Father's Day we remember the, the many the many sacrifices fathers make for their children and their families the, in different ways both big and small lifting children to a achieve dreams beyond their reach and this time we maybe pray for those fathers those men uh, those men those grandparents those mentor figures in our life who have brought our life meaning and as we pray we we too we remember all those who have helped fill the void when fathers have passed early or have been absent. Think of our mothers, our grandparents, our aunties and our uncles, our brothers and our sisters, our cousins, our teachers, our, our pastors, uh, our coaches. And for those who are fathers, we ask, Lord, for wisdom, for humility, in the face of the task of parenting give them strength to do well by their children and by you for in your your holy name we pray amen
from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. So as we come to the end of our service this morning, let me pray. Loving God, we give thanks for all of those dads and father figures who've been part of our lives, who've, who've been such a blessing to us. We thank you for that gift and, and we recognise all that they've been to us. We think of those who, who haven't had a, a good experience with their dad or father figure in their lives. Um, as Steve mentioned, for those who've been abusively present or achingly absent and, and have left a, a real negative um, association with fatherhood, for all those who've had that experience, God, I pray that you would come close to them this morning. We think of those who have um, become dads for the first time recently. And I think of those dads, particularly this morning, as, uh, as it's easy to feel overwhelmed or out of, out of your depth in, uh, in these first days and weeks and months. I pray that they would be blessed with a confidence and with all the tools they need to to be good dads and, and to, to enjoy this period of, of being a new dad. We think of those who would have loved to be a dad and, and just for one reason or another have never been able to do that. And, and we pray for those people that, they, um, that you would come close to them too. But I pray for all of us this morning. God, might we all know and be reminded and, and sense the privilege that comes from being an adopted heir in God's family. And, and might we know the difference that that makes in our lives, not just in the future for eternity, but right here and now in our day-to-day -day lives. May we know the confidence that comes from being an adopted heir in God's family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>